a history of pride in San Francisco. In 1970, there was a small march down Polk Street. The city known for fostering an open and welcoming community. Now, of course, it's one of the largest festivals of LGBTQ rights in the world. And a safe haven for some of the most marginalized people. It's still, I think, one of the most wonderful places on earth for an LGBT person to go to. A look back at the uprisings. The girls just, one of them just, you know, I'm not going to take this anymore. Those killed by the disease. The downfalls. But they had bumper strips that said AIDS, it's killing all the right people. The progress. When the girls opened up the windows, it was a very pioneering move. And the setbacks. There is still so much work to be done. KTVU Fox 2 presents A History of Pride, the LGBT plus movement in San Francisco. Over nearly five decades, San Francisco Pride has grown into one of the biggest, boldest, and most anticipated events in the city. Hello, and thank you for joining us for this KTVU Fox 2 special. I'm Alex Savage. And I'm Heather Holmes. Every June, hundreds of thousands of people pack the city's Castro neighborhood for a weekend full of color and costumes to celebrate the LGBTQ community. And this year's theme is Generations of Resistance. So over the next half hour, we're going to look back at the early days of San Francisco Pride and introduce you to one of the oldest and most well-known groups to take part in the parade, Dykes on Bikes. We'll also take you to one of San Francisco's oldest gay bars, still open today. Twin Peaks Tavern made history as one of the first in the nation to have full length windows, allowing its patrons to see and be seen by the public. And we'll also look back at some of the darkest days in LGBTQ history. The devastating AIDS epidemic, which killed 20,000 people in San Francisco alone and sparked fear and homophobia across the country and beyond. But we will start from the beginning with the uprising that sparked the pride movement nationwide. This year marks the 50th anniversary of the Stonewall riots in New York City, where members of the LGBTQ community fought back against police during a raid on a gay bar known as the Stonewall Inn. Those riots had a ripple effect all across the country, including in San Francisco, where the following year in 1970, the city had its very first pride parade. But as KTVU's Christina Rendon reports, the fight for equal rights started in San Francisco years before for the Stonewall riots in the city's Tenderloin neighborhood. San Francisco Pride. You know that this is our time. It's not pride for the sake of pride, it's about pride about being who you are, whatever that is. The colorful celebrations are deeply rooted in a history of LGBT activism. People quietly organizing in the late 1940s and 50s and challenging gender expectations in the 60s. The Tenderloin was one of San Francisco's first queer neighborhoods. There were uh, pimps, uh, there were uh, drug sales. You know, the Tenderloin was for the, um, say, like, the dregs of society. The city's downtown Tenderloin district is the home ground of the always visible segment of the city's homosexuals and transvestites. Donna Persona was 18 when she first went to Jean Compton's cafeteria, a gathering place at night for drag queens, transgender women, and sex workers. The cops would go in there routinely when they just wanted to bust heads and and, you know, scare people. In 1966, police came to the cafeteria to arrest men for impersonating women, leading to the Compton's Cafeteria riot. The girls just, one of them just, you know, I'm not gonna take this anymore. And she wasn't gonna take it, and she took this coffee, and she threw it right in his face. And, you know, then he jumped on her, and then all the girls in there jumped on the cops. It, it just, it was havoc in there. And they, they took it out into the street. Persona recently co-wrote a play about the riot that had a limited run in the Tenderloin. A memorial plaque now sits at the corner of Taylor and Turk. I want that story never ever to be forgotten. It, it was buried for about 45 years. It was like it had never happened. The Compton's cafeteria riots came three years before the more well-known Stonewall riots in New York City and is widely considered to be the start of transgender activism in San Francisco. Stonewall, it's really gained in significance across the entire world, and it's kind of seen as that point where, you know, a spark was lit 
and set off a protest movement ar around the country, a gay rights movement. But it really is uh, more of a mythological important event. It lasted for a few days, though, in New York, and uh, it, the ripple effects did continue around the world. Terry Beswick, executive director of the GLBT Historical Society, points back to the years of LGBT activism already happening on the West Coast. On the first anniversary of the Stonewall riots, San Francisco held its first Pride Parade. In 1970, there was a small march down Polk Street, which was prior to the Castro was seen as the center of uh, gay culture in San Francisco. Now, of course, it's you know a few hundred thousand people that come together, one of the largest uh, festivals of uh, LGBTQ rights in the world. Soon after, Harvey Milk made San Francisco home, later becoming the state's first openly gay elected official on the city's Board of Supervisors. In 1978, he was assassinated at City Hall, along with San Francisco Mayor George Moscone by former supervisor Dan White. I thought, this is it. This, this, it's over. Everything is over for me and for my community. White would receive a conviction of manslaughter, not murder, leading to the White Night Riots. The White Night Riots were a real outcry and an outpouring of grief, of anger, um, of rage. Rebecca Rolf with the San Francisco LGBT Center calls it another pivotal point in LGBT activism. When Dan White received what was a very light prison sentence, uh, I think there was a real deep sense of betrayal and another sense of this is another time that the courts have really failed us. Heartbreak led to strength over the decades. The gay community recognized the power in public protest and community organizing. And I think even in a place like San Francisco, where we think that we have really achieved so much, there is still so much work to be done. Right now, 50% of the homeless young people on the streets identify as LGBTQ. That is not okay. You know, so many trans women of color are getting murdered here in our city and across the country. That is not okay. What do we want? What do we want? The city's history of activism leads the theme for the 49th annual Pride Celebrations, Generations of Resistance. As young people are growing up in this culture of greater acceptance of LGBT rights, uh, sometimes they're not as aware of everyone that came before them. People like Donna Persona, for her work on behalf of transgender people, she is this year's SF Pride Lifetime Achievement Grand Marshal. I want to rekindle that, that fighting spirit from 50 years ago. That spirit, she says, is especially important today. Now more than ever, we need it. We need it again. I'm thinking of this current administration is uh, one by one attempting to remove everything that we've gained. And we're going to fight back with all these things that, that are coming at us. In San Francisco, Christina Rendon, KTVU, Fox 2 News. In the 1980s, the struggle for many in San Francisco's gay community wasn't just about equal rights. It was a matter of life and death. The city was the epicenter for the devastating AIDS epidemic, which wiped out tens of thousands of people in San Francisco alone, most of them gay men. KTV's Rob Ross spoke with those who were there for it all and saw firsthand the horrific toll it took, the fear it caused, and the activism that it inspired. It was a time of great sorrow and uh, overwhelming terror. Cleve Jones was there at the beginning when a mysterious and merciless virus began ripping through the heart of San Francisco's gay community. It was not unusual in this neighborhood to see people collapse and die on the street. Die from a virus that at first no one had ever heard of, acquired immune deficiency syndrome, better known as AIDS. It shuts down the patient's immune system, allowing in deadly infections. I was probably one of the earliest people to be infected with HIV in San Francisco and I'm one of the longest living survivors. When there were many times I didn't really think I was going to make it. Worst epidemic, total mystery, people were afraid. UC San Francisco oncologist Dying Paul Volberding is one of the pioneers of AIDS research. He saw his first AIDS patient in 1981. Here's this 22-year-old 
guy that's dying of this tumor that I never bothered studying because it was so rare. At first, doctors had no idea what they were dealing with. They'd see young gay men getting horribly sick, but there were no cures, and all they could really do was just watch them slowly wither away. Couples would come in, two men that were essentially married. One would die, then the next would die. Uh, it was horrible. The disease would eventually kill 20,000 people in San Francisco alone. Most of them gay men spread most often through sexual contact. It was common to see young men with sunken cheeks looking far older than their years, almost ghost-like. I'm so lucky and so many other people just weren't. Former San Francisco supervisor Jeff Sheehy was diagnosed with HIV, the virus that can lead to AIDS in 1996. I'm in bed with a fever of 104 and I can't move, I'm paralyzed with fatigue. With AIDS came fear. Straight people wondered about sitting on buses next to a gay person. What if he sneezes? This is what happened when a person with AIDS once came to a TV station for an interview. The sound guy wouldn't mic uh, the patient. I went with a patient and he wouldn't mic the patient because he was concerned about coming too close to an AIDS patient. AIDS also brought out homophobia. They had bumper strips that said AIDS, it's killing all the right people. And in 1986, a school district in San Luis Obispo hey, County wouldn't allow five-year-old Ryan Thomas to attend kindergarten after he contracted AIDS through a tainted blood transfusion. The administration was worried about Ryan spreading the virus to other children. Sadly, Ryan would die of the disease five years later. All the while, one church in the Castro District was holding as many as four funerals a day for AIDS victims. As soon as one ended, another would begin. But the federal government had stayed mostly silent about the so-called gay disease. I think then Mayor, now U.S. Senator Dianne Feinstein says San Francisco set the standard for AIDS research and care. It became evident to me uh, when I saw that some people wanted to ignore it that we had to set an example. We were really the first city to devote local funds for research and tre treatment. Cleve Jones, who started the San Francisco AIDS Foundation, wanted to show the toll AIDS was taking. The quilt still moves me deeply. In 1987, he created the idea for the AIDS quilt, the names of the dead stitched together, one next to the other. What was in my head was I'm going to take this thing, I'm going to lay it on the mall and show Congress and the president the consequences of their failures. I was not prepared for the artistry of it, the really extraordinary beauty of it. A piece of the quilt hangs on the wall of a restaurant near Market in Castro Streets. I'm reminded that 20,000 of my friends and neighbors were killed by this disease before effective treatment was found. By 1996, researchers came up with a mixture of medicines able to suppress the virus. It became known as the AIDS cocktail. I took a fistful of pills three times a day and felt sick at, immediately after I took them. And by the time I got over being sick from the pills, I had to take another dose. But they kept me alive. Now she, he, and other patients can take just one pill. There's still no cure for AIDS, and people still die from it. In San Francisco, the crisis passed, but the memory of it, for many, has not. We took care of people, and there was a great deal of love. We created the meal delivery programs, and the buddy programs, and the housing programs, and the spiritual programs. I think that as San Franciscans, uh, when we look back at our city's response, we have every reason to be proud. In San Francisco, Rob Roth, KTVU, Fox 2 News. The roar of their engines has marked the start of the San Francisco Pride Parade now for decades. Coming up, the mission and the message of the Dykes on Bikes and their long journey to acceptance, which includes a stop at the U.S. Supreme Court. It's about visibility in our community. It's about women's empowerment. It's about saying, I'm a, I'm a woman, I'm proud of who I am. I happen to ride a motorcycle. I happen to be gay. First, more LGBTQ history in San Francisco. The rainbow flag became an international symbol of pride thanks to San Francisco artist Gilbert Baker. Baker sewed the first rainbow flag back in 1978, but never trademarked his work, saying it was his gift to the world. Baker died in 2017 at the age of 65. 1978 was the moment for us to have a flag. We were, as I say, a global tribe, and we are we are, we are a global uh, power. And so a flag is a way of proclaiming power and visibility.
Welcome back to this KTVU Fox 2 special. San Francisco Pride is a celebration full of tradition, a tradition that includes the annual Trans March held on the Friday of Pride weekend. The first Trans March was held in 2004. Organizers say it is now one of the largest trans events in the world. Another Pride tradition, the Dyke March, held the Saturday of every Pride weekend since 1993. The Dyke March is organized entirely by volunteers. It starts with speeches and performances at Dolores Park and ends in the Castro District. But the biggest event at San Francisco Pride is undoubtedly the Pride Parade that closes out the weekend. Many things have changed with the parade over the years, but one thing has remained consistent. The group that kicks off the festivities has been there from the very beginning. Gateview's Monty Francis introduces us to the women of Dykes on Bikes. Their rumble is loud and filled with power. Every year since 1976, Dykes on Bikes have led the San Francisco Pride Parade. When we start up hundred, hundreds of motorcycles, there's power in that, and that rumble reverberates down Market Street. Kate Brown is the group's current president, presiding over a group with a simple message and a long legacy. It's about visibility in our community. It's about women's empowerment. It's about saying, I'm a, I'm a woman, I'm proud of who I am. I happen to ride a motorcycle, I happen to be gay. Since its founding more than four decades ago as a small contingent, the group now has 18 chapters in the world, across the U.S., Europe, Australia, and Iceland. When we ride down Market Street in the parade, for me it symbolizes all the times that little girls in their lives who have motorcycles that are told they can't it's their chance to say, yes, they can. Part of the group's legacy is a 13-year legal fight that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. In the end, the group won the right to trademark its name and logo after being refused to do so by the U.S. Trademark and Patent Office. The case revolved around the term dyke, which the government considered a disparaging term. The word dyke was used as an epithet, and that's a term that we use when we refer to our own selves, and as a self-referential term, it's a term with power. Honoring the group's legacy includes honoring the memory of founding member Sunny Wolf, who died last year. She rode with us for almost 40 years. I mean, she was so much the, the heart of this organization and the memory keeper and our secretary for decades. It also means passing on that legacy and history to new riders, like Pam Kwan, who's riding in her first parade this year. Whenever I say I'm a dyke on a bike, it's automatically associated with San Francisco dyke on a bike and the legacy that Sunny Wolf has already built, you know? So it's, it's a great feeling to be recognized and for all that they've done. There's something about being a dyke on a bike that is powerful. Um, that I don't know that I would find anywhere else. Riding with pride, honoring the past, and forging the road ahead. In San Francisco, Monty Francis, KTVU Fox 2 News. Bars and clubs providing a sense of belonging for the LGBTQ community. Coming up after the break, we explore San Francisco's queer nightlife then and now, and how those businesses grew to thrive against the odds. Everybody told them, it's not going to make it. Like, you know, the people are not going to come in here. First, more LGBTQ history and a familiar site on Twin Peaks in San Francisco. The Pink Triangle has been installed by volunteers every Pride weekend since 1995. Organizer Patrick Carney says the symbol was once used by Nazis in concentration camps to identify homosexual prisoners. Now it's been reclaimed as a symbol of pride. Welcome back to this KTVU Fox 2 special, a milestone moment in San Francisco in 2004 when then mayor, now California Governor Gavin Newsom, granted the first official marriage licenses to same sex couples. The move set off a long legal fight that went all the way to the Supreme Court. In 2008, voters legalized same sex marriage here in California, and in 2013, same sex marriages were recognized nationwide. And many say the legalization of same sex marriage allowed LGBTQ neighborhoods like San Francisco's Castro District to thrive. But as KTVU's Paul Chambers tells us, business owners today say the the fight for inclusivity isn't over. 
The rainbow flag is a symbol of pride and acceptance for the LGBTQ community. It's an image seen all over San Francisco's Castro District, an area that's had an open and welcoming nightlife since the 1970s. This is the first bar I ever went in in the Castro. In 1972, the owners of Twin Peaks Tavern changed the narrative for the LGBTQ nightlife, bringing it out of the closet after installing full-length windows where people could be seen, becoming what is believed to be the first bar in the nation to do so. When the girls opened up the windows, it was a very pioneering move because most of the bars were dark and you had to kind of hide. Everybody told them, it's not going to make it. It's like, you know, that people are not going to come in here. Club owners say over the years, the nightlife in the Castro has had its ups and downs. Today, smartphone apps allow people to meet up without going out. But some say 10 years ago, the creation of this reality competition show brought people back into the nightlife. People go to see RuPaul's Drag Race girls. Honey Mahogany, co-owner of the Stud Bar, knows firsthand. I am a RuPaul's Drag Race alumni, um, and I do think that the change that, that show has really changed the way in which um, nightlife happens. The area has changed with the times. Some say it's becoming more inclusive as the community gains more allies. Others says doing that is coming at a cost. With the greater acceptance that we've achieved, that we're sort of um, losing sight of the beautiful things in our community, our identity, our uniqueness, what we bring to the table. For decades, Castro has been considered the home of the gay community here in San Francisco. But as the LGBTQ community becomes more diverse, some say they just don't fit in. And that's why they say the future of the queer community is outside of this neighborhood. We don't have a space for women. We don't have a space for trans folks that is dedicated. Some in the community say bars like The Stud and others are needed for San Francisco's queer nightlife to thrive. They say the wave of the future, places that cater towards lesbians, people of color, and the trans community who often feel left out in the Castro. And that's why the bar Jolene's was created. I had several places to go and then all of a sudden none. Um, or all of a sudden like only Tuesdays. Back over the Castro, the new owner of Q Bar is taking note, hosting Vice Tuesdays, a weekly party dedicated to those who feel they don't fit in in a place that is supposed to be welcoming to all. In San Francisco, I'm Paul Chambers, KTVU, Fox 2 News. Thank you for watching this KTVU Fox 2 special. Our coverage continues on KTV.com. Thanks so much for joining us.